In the United States, access to social welfare benefits, including supplemental security income and social security disability insurance, is increasingly contingent on biology or health rather than socioeconomic need, a situation that's led to the concept of biological citizenship. As a result, physicians serve as gatekeepers of these public benefits. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Hippolytus Kolofanos, an assistant professor at the International Institute and Center for Social Medicine and Humanities at UCLA and the Greater Los Angeles Veterans Affairs Medical Center. As part of the journal's Case Studies in Social Medicine series, Dr. Kolofanos has written a perspective article about the increased stakes of medical diagnoses for poor patients and the role of physicians in facilitating access to disability benefits. Dr. Kolofanos, in your perspective article, you described the case of Mr. P, a patient at a community mental health clinic who applied for public housing and supplemental security income. What was his physician's role in that process, and how did that affect their relationship? His physician, in this case, was a psychiatrist, and it was actually me. And I was documenting how he was doing in the chart. And he was also applying for SSI, which his case manager was handling. And there is a form for the physician for me to sign as a part of that application. And so my role was taking care of him, documenting how he was doing. And for that SSI application, my role was to fill out that form and sort of work with the team to make sure his application went in. So you write that over the past 40 years, U.S. social policy has shifted away from government provision of social services toward a free market approach to social welfare. How did we get where we are today, and what has this change meant for patients? How did we get here? It's really been a political shift starting in the 1980s with political attacks against welfare policy and sort of accusations of overdependence and abuse, epithets like welfare queen against people who are receiving welfare. And starting in the 80s, the social welfare benefits that we did have started getting cut, trimmed back. A big cut to social welfare benefits happened in 1996 with uh, President Clinton's Personal Responsibility and Work Reconciliation Act that really replaced the primary federal welfare program, Aid to the Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC, with a temporary program, temporary assistance to needy families that was constrained by a lifetime benefit cap. And kind of across the board, there were stricter eligibility criteria implemented, um, requirements for workforce participation. I mean, it's always been harder for applicants without children to get benefits, and it became much harder those folks tend to rely on state and local welfare benefits, general assistance programs that have also not grown in relation to inflation. And so in LA, we have a situation where general assistance programs are basically $220 a month in LA County, a place where you know the median price of a one-bedroom apartment is over $1,300. And so because of that kind of tightening on general welfare benefits, disability payments, they're still not overly generous, but SSI, what my patient was seeking, would have granted him a little bit over $800 a month. And so to answer your question, we've gotten to where we are now through basically an erosion of our social welfare benefit and a general erosion of social sector services. You can see this happening in public education as well as health and welfare. And then looking specifically at doctors and patients, do physicians generally know when their clinical documentation can be used to determine whether one of their patients has access to these public benefits? That's a great question. I think physicians can assume that their chart notes can be kind of audited by Social Security and by other funders. But I don't think, as physicians, we are kind of sufficiently oriented to really thinking about this process and our role in the process and what our patients face. We kind of speaking from experience, I felt like in my training, I got a lot of mixed messages about um, how to respond to requests for filling out disability paperwork. And I see that now as an attending physician, supervising residents, I see a lot of confusion. I see a lot of questions about how to respond and what our role is. And I kind of hear it with colleagues as well. So I do think part of my motivation in writing this piece was really clearly laying out the role that physicians do have and the role of these benefits, particularly in poor patients' lives. In fact, you write in your article that a welfare system that ties benefits to disability creates a perverse incentive. It grants patients access to critical services only if they're disabled enough. So 
how can physicians help their patients navigate this system, get the benefits they need, knowing that reality, that perverse incentive? I think that's where a lot of the consternation and the unease with the process comes from, I think, and it is a complicated process. And it was sort of illustrated dramatically by my patient who said, you can't write that I'm getting better. I'm not getting better. I'm very sick and I'm going to stay sick. And so it was sort of, wait a minute, no, that's not what we want. We want you to get better. What's happening here? And so I think there's a few levels that as a physician, we can respond to this on. The first is really taking seriously what a patient's needs and motivations and goals are. And one thing I could have done differently is really sat down with him when he was asking me about his social security application and really figuring out how he saw that application as fitting in with to his goals and his needs. And I could have collaborated with the rest of the team, I think, more closely that first time to be sure that we were doing everything we can for him. I think there's often a question of this notion of disability benefits being a kind of a trap that and you see people saying they may foster pathological dependence, getting people stuck on benefits and then not wanting to work. And I think that is a, something to explore with patients. However, when we look at, for instance, my patients, what he was facing and the amount he was actually going to get from these benefits and what he was up against in the disparity between housing costs and what's available for him on the job market. So earning minimum wage to afford that median income, one bedroom apartment rent in LA, he would have to work 79 hours a week. So I don't see this as a trap giving him disability benefits. I don't see this as creating pathological dependence. This case has helped me reframe that in another way, I sort of see these benefits as creating a relationship and helping him sustain this relationship between him and us and his service providers. And part of him getting better was creating healthy relationships, healthy social relationships, coming out of isolation, coming out of homelessness and becoming more connected. And I came to see SSI as sort of this glue we could offer him to help him really get connected in this very real way, economically as well as socially. And so I actually saw it not as fostering independence, but a really healthy connection. And I saw it as a therapeutic intervention that we could do for him. And so I I think entering it that way rather than automatically becoming suspicious of a patient's motivations, is he trying to gain the system, is he malingering, is he exaggerating? Certainly, we see that, and certainly, we want to be careful about who gets these CARES benefits. But in my experience, I think there tends to be a cultural preoccupation around deservingness and the sort of moral value of work and of independence. And so I think culturally, in the United States at least, we tend to be overly suspicious of patients who are seeking benefits, gaming the system, you hear that a lot, or malingering. I think another way to sidestep this whole dilemma is kind of a longer game of developing a different system for supporting patients like this. And rather than creating the system that only supports somebody with a certain level of disability, having a broader program of support that moves more towards social protection so, and, that, and that is more based on economic status than disability. So finally, looking at that concept of social protection, You say in the article that physicians can advocate for that more inclusive policy, an alternative to the current social safety net. What would that kind of policy look like in the United States, and what would it take politically to get us there? That's a great question. At this point, I think it's really something we can do as physicians is just begin this discussion and get more educated. I mean, I think there's a lot of different models and pilots out there. And I started writing this case a couple years ago, well before there emerged a Democratic candidate for president who actually is making basic income grant as a major part of his platform. So there's a lot more awareness of this as a possible policy now than I think there ever has been before. I think getting educated about what it means, and, and it requires, I think, a fundamental shift in how we think about social welfare and the idea that everybody is entitled to a basic minimum rather than the idea that only those who are down on their luck. Only those who have fallen deserves a helping hand to pull them up. I think the reality with the current economy, and especially in places like LA, where the cost of living are so high, that we really need a different model. And we need to think about it in a way of how do we bring more people in? How do we create a more inclusive model rather than one that's based on trying to keep people out through eligibility criteria, stigmatized benefits? How do we create a model that's actually just and equitable and inclusive? Thank you, Dr. Kolofinos.